You know what the difference is between a thermostat and a thermometer, right? The thermometer reveals the temperature. The thermostat appeals the temperature. It creates change. We're called to be thermostats with our lives. How do you do that? Well, hang in there a few minutes, and we're going to learn some how-tos together that you can actually do every day of your life. Welcome to the Avenues.Church. I'm so glad you're here. It's week five of our Best Value series. If you'll use the QR code on the screen, you'll be able to check in and get immediate access to my notes for today's talk. Plus, when you check in, you get to let us know you're here and respond to the talk. Today, we're looking at changing the temperature. It's about influence. Influencers are a hot topic these days in social media. But the social media we're talking about isn't limited to the metaverse. It's for wherever you are in the universe. In this series, we're looking at eight values that help us build lives that are aligned with Jesus' values. And today, we're looking at how we as people who've said yes to Jesus can be influencers for Jesus. We see this thermostat function in many people's lives in the Bible. Some people changed the spiritual temperature, but made things worse. But there are others in the Bible who did improve the spiritual climate. They made hot times a little bit cooler and cold hearts a little bit warmer. If you watched last week's talk by Pastor Chris, you'll recall that he did a flyover with us of the life of Daniel and Daniel's three close buds. Do you remember what happened to those friends? Shadrach, Abednego, and Meshach. I'll just call them Sam for short, okay? We're tossed into a superheated furnace because King Nebuchadnezzar, or as I like to call him, King Neb, was furious. Why was he furious? Well, he had had a 90-foot gold statue of himself made, and he signed into law a decree that said, bow down and worship this statue of me, or I'll throw you into a fire pit that's much bigger and much hotter than the one you have in your backyard. Of course, they refused to worship the statue or the king. And that's what made King Neb furious. So he called them in and gave them a second chance. Boys, bow before my image, and we'll let bygones be bygones. If not, you fry. You'll be kosher hot dogs on my grill, and you'll die. They chose to stay faithful to God, though. So Neb cranked up the furnace to seven times hotter than usual and tossed Sam in. It was so hot that the guards who threw them in the uh, fire died from the heat. And then what happened? They changed the temperature. Well, more precisely, they stayed faithful to God and God insulated them from the fire. He kept them cool while the heat skyrocketed. God used their faithfulness to him and made them thermostats, people who changed the spiritual climate that they lived in. Wouldn't you like to do that? Here are some nuts and bolts that I've called the five how-tos for living my life as a Jesus influencer. Let me just give them straight up to you. First, magnify the influence Jesus gives me. Second, exemplify the influence of Jesus' words in me. Third, personify the influence of a Jesus culture in the community where God sets me. Fourth, amplify the influence of the Spirit of Jesus with the people God opens to me. And fifth, intensify the influence of Jesus through my service in the church where God places me. Now, let's dig a little deeper into each of these so we can see some details about how to do them in our day-to-day -day lives. First, magnify the influence Jesus gives me. Look again at what the Bible says happened after the three young men were thrown into the superheated inferno. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. I guess the heat burned off the ropes that bound them, but it didn't burn them. When the king looked in the furnace, they're chilling. I mean, they're just walking around. 
I can imagine them talking. Shad, is your sunscreen holding up? <laughs> oh, yeah, bro, it's all cool. But most interestingly, it's not just Sam in there walking around. There's a fourth person, and the king says he looks like a son of the gods. Interesting phrase, right? Many Bible scholars believe this is not a son of the gods, but the son of God, Jesus, making a miraculous appearance before the miracle of his birth. Here's the big how-to. If you'll take the heat and be faithful to God, regardless of how hot it gets, Jesus will show up. And the superheated spot you're in will cool down. And that's how you begin to magnify the influence that Jesus gives you. This is what Sam did when King Neb gave them a second chance to worship him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. They weren't being cocky. They weren't leaning on their own abilities. Instead, they stood firmly on the authority of the Lord. They treated the king respectively, your majesty, they said twice, but they magnified, they blew up the influence the Lord gave them. So not only did Sam come out of the furnace alive, but they came out with enlarged influence. Look at this. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. Their circle of influence is growing. And they saw, now watch this, they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed, their robes were not scorched, and, and, and there was no smell of fire on them. What? <laughs> Do you know how hard it is just to be next to a barbecue pit and not end up smelling like smoke? This is amazing. Oh, but there's more. Now look at this. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. This is the king talking. Now watch what happens. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Sam got a promotion, and the circle of influence that they had got bigger. Why? Because they magnified the influence the Lord gave them. So King Neb takes a step toward God. He saw Sam's faithfulness, but he also saw, saw God's faithfulness. And he is stirred in his heart toward God. Their faithfulness results in a dramatic change in the spiritual climate around them. So not only does God get Sam out of a physical hot spot and keep them cool, not only does he enlarge their area of influence, but the bigger deal, the greater influence, is that King Neb starts to move toward God. But he did what a lot of us do. He was moved by what God had done. But his move is like two steps forward, three steps back in terms of faith in God. In other words, he believed what he saw, but he didn't let the change in temperature change him. He just thought it was cool. And then all of a sudden, he runs from God. That's when he has a terrible nightmare. Dan Daniel's called in to interpret it. Daniel says, if you keep running from God, you're going to go insane. And he did. And he did. But that's not the end of King Neb's story. In Daniel 4, the king's faith takes a real step forward. Look at this. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, 
raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. Then he writes some poetry praising God and says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. This is King Neb's personal testimony of how he became a believer. Magnifying the influence Jesus gives you starts with a commitment. Have you committed to use your influence for Jesus? You can. Just do what King Neb says Sam did. His report, they trusted in him and defied my command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any God but God. How about you? Will you trust in the Lord and serve him? The first step is commitment. This leads to the second how-to. Exemplify the influence of Jesus' words in me. Exemplify means incarnate, live out. Pastor Chris mentioned this last Sunday, but I want to go back to it because it is so important for changing the temperature. King Neb had that bad dream that he couldn't understand. It was a real nightmare, and he couldn't shake it from his mind. So he calls Daniel in to help him. Daniel's shaken by what God's words reveal about the dream. He doesn't want to tell the king, but the king insists. You see, Daniel, the influencer, was sought out by the king because the king knew that Daniel lived out, lived by, lived in the truth of what God says. Daniel finally reveals the truth to King Neb. This is all about demonstrating with your life that the Bible is your go-to for directions for living. Always tell, pe tell the people God gives you influence with that you're living by the word of God. So they'll know that it's about him, not you. For Sam, this started long before the whole Hot Pockets thing. And it started with the influence of their friend Daniel. Look at this from Daniel chapter 1. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these name, these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. So they're all renamed with names that reflect the culture they've been made captives of. Their new names actually honor the gods of Babylon. Now, watch this. Verse 8. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. The word of God said that as Jews, they are not to eat or drink certain things. This was part of honoring God's calling on their lives to be his people and be his witnesses to the world around them. But in this moment, they're slaves. How could they have any influence? Well, first, Daniel led them to the decision to follow God's word. And then he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. And they worked out a plan that demonstrated that God's word was better than the king's plan. That's what you can do too. You can live as the Bible tells us to live because we know that it's the owner's manual for life. And when you do that, you become an example. You exemplify God's ways as taught in God's word. You show that his ways are the best ways. I often use the example of darkness and a pinhole of light. You see, until a person says yes to Jesus, they're living in spiritual darkness. But when you live out the truth and power of God by doing what Jesus says to do, it becomes a pinhole in the darkness of their lives where light shines through. And when you're in the dark and a tiny speck of light comes through the tiniest hole, where do your eyes go? To the light. And that's what happens when you live your life Jesus' way. How do you do that? Just do what Sam did. What did they say to King Neb? God, whom we serve, is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, even if he's got a different plan than we think he has, we will not serve or worship anything other than him. Where did they get that from? 
It all goes back to the way, uh, to the decision they made together to not eat the king's provided food. So they had learned to practice peaceful but powerful words. Sometimes just having rehearsed the right words can help you in the moment. So let's take Sam's words, tweak them for today, and practice them. Imagine you're at work or school or at home, and a moment comes when you can say something to someone about Jesus. Maybe they've said something that reveals a tear in their heart, trouble with the love of their life, uh, a child who's gone off the rails, uh, a parent who's suddenly very sick, uh, or they're facing a threat to their finances, their job. And the Lord opens the door for you to influence them. What do you do? What do you say? How about something like this? Can I pray for you? Let's practice that. Say it with me. Can I pray for you? Again. Can I pray for you? Once more. Can I pray for you? If they answer yes, and you can pray with them in that moment, do it. If not, then tell them what you're going to pray. I'm going to ask God to rescue you, your marriage, your child, your job in this situation. Something very short, not preachy, just caring. When you do that, you've exemplified the influence of the Lord's word in you. In fact, in Jesus' concluding words in his Sermon on the Mount, he tells a little story about two people who built their homes, one on the sand and one on the rock. What does the sand and rock represent? Well, look at Jesus' own words. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. What's the rock? Hearing and putting into practice Jesus' words. So what's the saying? Jesus adds, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. So when you listen to and live out the word of God, you become an influence in people's lives. You're leading others to start listening to Jesus. Daniel influenced Sam and Sam influenced the king. That's what happens when you imitate a person who is imitating Jesus with their life. That's what Paul tells us to do. You should imitate me, Paul says, just as I imitate Christ. Because when you put Jesus' words into action, you become an influencer for Jesus. And that leads to the third how-to. Personify the influence of a Jesus culture in the community where God sets me. Are you familiar with the Old Testament book of Haggai? It's easy to miss. It's very short. And even if you read it, you may not understand it if you don't do a little extra work to get the historical context. Well, today is not about a study of Haggai, but I do want to go there and show you the opening verses because they give us great insight about warming things up with our lives. Let's read it, and then I'll show you the big how-to. On August 29 of the second year of King Darius' reign, the Lord gave a message through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Okay, <laughs> pretty dry stuff, but it sets the picture in history. Specifically, this is the year 520 B.C. That's all you need to know about that for today. Verse 2. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. In other words, Haggai is about to report God's specific message for the people in this specific moment in time. Here it is. The people are saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Did you catch that? The Lord's first message is that the people are saying, it's not time to worry about rebuilding the Lord's house. You know what I came here for as relaunch pastor to the avenues.church? I came to work with you to rebuild the Lord's house. Not so much the outward appearance of a building, but the hearts of the people who've said yes already to Jesus. So I want to ask you, how's your heart? Is it cold or is it warm toward rebuilding the church to reach people for Jesus? A pastor can only do so much. I can only lead you to the life-giving water. I can't make you drink. Are you thirsty for righteousness? Is your heart heating up 
for people who are lost and destined for eternity without God? Let's go on. Verse 3. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? God's calling them to action. You're doing fine. Your houses are looking good. You've had Chip and Joanna Gaines fix up your fixer-upper. But what about my house? What about getting my place for worship fixed up? This isn't primarily about a building, even in its historical context. It's about the hearts of people who've already said yes to God and their dedication, or lack of it, to adding to the household of God. Let's go on. Verse 5. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says. Here comes the reality check. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. You, weigh, you Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. What's God doing? He's holding up a reality check mirror for them, for us, for you. He's saying what you're doing isn't working because what you're doing is misaligned. It doesn't line up with your primary calling as a believer in and follower of Jesus. Jesus said you are to be my witnesses wherever you are and wherever you go. You are to be a good news of Jesus seed planter so that you can be his influencer in the lives of people. So you plant seeds, but you also prepare the soil. You also add water and nutrients. You also make sure they get adequate sunlight. If you don't do this, you'll have very little to harvest. And so you'll eat, you'll come to church and be fed, but you won't be satisfied. You'll drink of the water of life, but you'll stay thirsty. You'll spend money to improve this or change that, but it'll be money down the drain like holes in your pockets. Why? Why? Because you're enjoying the forgiveness of your sin. You're relaxing in the grace that came to you through Jesus. You're basking in the glory of salvation that broke out in your life because someone somewhere sometime planted the seed of the good news of Jesus in you. You're enjoying your life in Jesus. But what about your assignment? What about leading others to the water of life? What about planting the good news in the hearts of the people that God brings into your life every day? Are you so caught up in making a living that you have no time for making the life of someone else good by telling them the good news of Jesus? Are you personifying a Jesus culture with your life? I mean, is your life at all distinguishable? from how those who need Jesus live? Can they feel a difference in the spiritual climate because you're living as a thermostat, because you're changing the spiritual temperature instead of just reporting it? By the way, did you catch that little phrase tucked into the reality check mirror? You put on clothes but cannot keep warm? Why is that? Because God designed our lives to be lived close to others. We are meant to be close to others. We are meant to be so close to others that God can use us to warm their hearts toward him. Ecclesiastes 4.11 says, Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? This isn't a reference to being at home tucked into a warm bed next to your wife or husband or with your kids or dog. This picture is about being in a harsh environment, being outside in the cold, no fire. And Solomon is the writer, and he's telling us, you can warm another person if you'll take the risk to get close enough to them. It's about influence. God made you for being that close. This is about being close, even though you can't be connected. You cannot be truly connected with someone who hasn't yet said yes to Jesus. They are a friend. They are not yet a brother or sister. So you can't have that spiritual family connection yet, but you can be close to them. And if you're not, if you choose to not be close to those God gives you to influence, you will find that your clothes, wait, t time out. <laughs> How close are your clothes to you? They're right next to your skin, right? So 
God's telling you that if you're not close to those he gives you to be an influencer for Jesus with, then your intimate connection with your church family won't keep you warm either, no matter how many layers you wear. God gives us each other as the church to warm us up when we're together so that we can go out into the cold and warm someone up. Then we come back together to get reheated so we're ready to go back out and warm someone up for Jesus. God's saying that you won't get the benefit of being warmed by your church family if you're not warming others who need Jesus when you're away from your church family. That's what these verses mean. You'll plant, but your crops, they won't produce enough. You'll eat, but you won't get no satisfaction. You'll drink, but your thirst won't be quenched. And the money you're spending is money wasted because it's not being used for creating a Jesus culture in your life. And tucked right into all of this. Oh yeah, and you're freezing your booty off too because you can't keep your heart warm towards the Lord no matter how often you're at, at church if you don't live a Jesus culture life when you're not at church. Now, after the bad news, the Lord drops the temperature change agent into their laps. And guess what? It's so simple, so straightforward, and it's the fourth how-to for changing the spiritual temperature in someone else's life. Amplify the influence of the Spirit of Jesus with the people God opens to you. Back to Haggai. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says. Look at what's happening to you. He's saying to us, take stock, look in the mirror, you want to know why you're not changing the spiritual climate where you are, in your avenues, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school, on your team, with your family, in your church? You want to know why you're failing to change the temperature? I'm so glad that God points out our shortcomings. And I'm more glad that he always couples it with his solution. And that's what happens next, verse 8. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies. While all of you are busy building your own fine houses, it's because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olive trees and all your other crops, a drought to starve you and your livestock and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. Now look back at verse eight. Here's how to amplify the influence of the spirit of Jesus with the people he's put in your life. Look at it again. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. When you do these three things, you will warm things up spiritually for others. God already had told them that they've misplaced their priorities. Now he gives them the, the way to correct things, rebuild my house. Now God's talking here about a physical structure for worship. But that's not what today's talk is on. Haggai is reporting that God isn't pleased with the fact that the people are in love with their own luxuries and have saturated themselves with what makes their lives better. By the way, not a problem. God's not condemning them for enjoying the good things of life. Here's the problem. My house lies in ruins while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. Do you see the disconnect? They're acting like this life they've been given is all about them, but it isn't. They've misaligned their priorities. Let me divert for a moment and talk about that. Do you know what happens when you build a house and misalign the priorities? Well, the story of the three little pigs helps. You remember it? The three little pigs built houses. The first one built a house with what material? Straw. And the second built a house with what? Sticks. Now, if you build a house with straw or sticks, how stable do you think it really is? What can it really stand against? Well, certainly not the big bad wolf. 
He'll just huff and puff and blow the houses down. You see, if you prioritize just building a house and do not prioritize the materials you build with or the builder who actually does the building, you've misaligned the priorities and your house will fall apart. If you build your house without the master builder, you're wasting your time. You're building what will not, cannot stand. In Jesus' words, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Psalm 127 verse 1 explains, unless the Lord builds a house. The work of the builders is wasted. Do you know who wrote the 127th Psalm? Solomon. He was the original temple builder. But his life, his life was a catastrophe because he built his home without submitting the plans to the master builder. So we start with the end in mind, and the end is that it is the Lord's house that must take priority. But we're not talking about a gathering place for the church here. We're talking about the place that is God's highest priority, your heart. All throughout the Bible, the focus of God is always on the heart of the individual. Why? Because God's great design for your life hinges on your heart for him. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. It's all about your heart. Jesus is cranking up the heat in the room with these opening words. He's challenging the cold, cold hearts of people. He's saying these are the attitudes you need to be to be blessed by God. But guess what? You can't do these on your own. Unless God builds the house, unless God gets hold of your heart, you will not be able to receive God's blessings. You will not see you will not connect with God. Here's the clincher. Jesus is not only the master builder, he is the great physician. So Jesus came first to change your heart and then to build your house so that you can change the temperature in other people's lives by inviting them into your life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in you that influences the lives of others. And that brings us to the fifth how-to. Intensify the influence of Jesus through my service in the church where God places me. Okay, back to Haggai. Start with the end in mind. It's about God's house, and I am that house. As Paul uh, rhetorically asks, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So the picture is about building God's home in me for the good of others. So secondly, now go up into the hills. In other words, get moving. Where are the trees? Where will you get the timber? I can see them. Can't you? They're up in the hills. This is important to get. You ready? The trees you need are on the hills that you seed. The trees they needed to build God's house were trees that someone planted. Since the people had built themselves fine houses, you have to think that they also replaced, replanted the ground that they had cut trees from. Why do I say that? Because there were trees there again. Here's the timeline. 70 years, after 70 years in exile, living in Babylon for two generations at least, the people of God see light on the horizon. Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon and very quickly lets the Jewish people return to their homeland. Of course, they get there and nothing's left. No homes, no temple. The date is 538 BC. The people go back. They start rebuilding, cutting down trees to build homes and businesses, but not taking time or expense to rebuild the temple. However, seeds from the trees fell on the ground and some took root and grew. Maybe they even decided to replant the hillsides. But one way or another, the hills were alive with the sound of trees, <laughs> maybe music too. So God tells them, now go up into the hills. Go to where the trees are. Go to where the supplies needed for building are. The trees you need are on the hills that you seed. Then God tells them, bring down timber. 
In other words, get the lumber needed for rebuilding the temple and bring it where it's needed and then rebuild my house. If you want to change the temperature, if you want to be a person of warm influence, you got to go up into the hills, bring down the timber, and build God's house. What's that mean for you? First, identify the hills, the people that God gives you to influence for Jesus. Second, use your influence to change the landscape in people's lives. By the way, do you know what influence is? It comes from Latin. It literally means imperceptible, tiny actions that produce change. In other words, help the people God's sending you. Help them see the value of God's presence in your life so they'll start to desire his presence in their lives. Third, rebuild God's space in their lives. You see, they're already made in the image of God. So it's not like they're godless. They just need more God. They've been duped into thinking that they're a God, just like we have been duped. They, they think that they call the shots, that they're in control. But in our saner moments, we all look at our lives and we know if this is what it means to be in charge of my life, to be the God of me, I resign. So they run around looking for other gods, and those gods take many forms. But primarily in our culture today, it's about wealth and what money can do for me. What newer car can I get? What better living space can I get? What cutting edge tech can I get? What exotic food can I get? What clothes can I get? What are the influencers saying I need to get so I can be happy? In the midst of all the confusion, in steps you. God brings you into their lives so that you can be his influencer in their lives. Just like Paul said, you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. That's a great statement to memorize and emblazon on your heart. Imitate me, not as I imitate the culture's prized possessions, not as I pick and choose what I want to believe about God, not as I elevate me and make it all about me. No, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. This is about influencing people by how you choose to live, how you make decisions, how you face difficulties, how you spend your wealth, how you climb the ladder of success. You see, the way you do those things needs to be guided by your walk with Jesus. In other words, you're saying with your life choices, I see that Jesus did this when he faced hard times, sad occasions, bad situations. And because Jesus did it this way, I'm going to do it this way, his way, because I've decided to believe him when he says, I am the way. So, are you ready to be an influencer for Jesus? The first step is to say yes to Jesus. If you're ready to do that today, I want to lead you on a simple prayer that can connect you directly with him. Will you pray this with me and make it your prayer from your heart to God's heart? Dear Jesus, right now I invite you to change the spiritual climate of my life. I call upon your name to save me from my sin, give me a life worth living, and to prepare a place in your home with you when this life is over. I turn from my old life and accept the new life that comes because of your sacrifice on the cross that paid for my sins and your resurrection, which gives me the assurance of eternal life. Thank you for saving me. Help me to now be a person who changes the spiritual climate in other people's lives. Let me be an influencer for you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. If you said yes to Jesus, whether it was just now or many years ago, I wanna ask you a question. Will you let Jesus use your life to change the spiritual temperature in someone else's life? I invite you to do that, to recommit yourself to be an influencer for Jesus with your life in the life of the people he puts around you. Please let me know of any decision you've made for Jesus today. I want to pray for you and support you. You can text me at 669-207-5239 or email me at pastors at gmail.com. And for more resources, please visit our website, theavenues.church. We're so glad you joined us at theavenues.church online today. You are loved. Always. See ya.